This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It is a marketing communication, is not for onward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise. Past performance does not predict future returns, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only, and references made to individual securities should not constitute or form part of any offer or solicitation to issue, sell, subscribe or purchase the security. Hello and welcome to Your Biggest Investment, a podcast mini-series from Janice Henderson Investors, exploring how the financial decisions you make today can help you build the future you want for your children. Throughout the series, we'll be speaking to parents about some of the common financial challenges they have faced and how they've gone about resolving them. In this first episode, we're going to kick things off by speaking to Dan and Lucy Howe to find out what life is like as busy parents, when they started thinking about their children's future, and how they went about planning and investing for the life they wanted. Dan and Lucy also talk about some of the challenges they've had to overcome and share some of the big financial goals they have set themselves to give their children the best start in life. Dan and Lucy Howe. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. Yes. So, Lucy, let's start with you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your family? So maybe where you're based, what both of you do, perhaps a little bit about your children. Yeah, of course. So we're a family of five. We live in the New Forest near Lymington. And we've got three very active boys, aged 13, 11 and 6. All very, very sporty always out and about, whether it's on the water or out in the forest. So Dan and I both work full time. Yeah, that's a little bit about our family setup. Okay, so you've got quite an active family. How do you balance the cost and expenses involved with your children's activities? Well, fortunately, they do a range of um, activities, some not quite as expensive as others. So Freddie's a massive rugby player and he's very focused on that. Um, Felix is a sailor and he does a lot of racing in Optimists and he's just been up to Scotland doing the national championships and over in Ireland. So obviously that is far more expensive to do. And then we've got Oliver who right at the moment he's only six so he's more into his Lego and things like that. So his time will come I'm sure. (laughs) And Dan, how did you feel about financing all these activities? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, thankfully, they aren't that expensive, but they are coming at a point in your life where there are so many calls on the family finances. And you know what you're probably getting from talking to Lucy and myself is that you know everything we do is about the family. And it's about buying a house big enough for us all to fit in in the right location where we want to grow up. At the same time, paying for education. At the same time, thinking about saving for the children's future. So it all comes at once and that makes it pretty tough. And was this something that you were quite aware of before you started having children or was it something that was sort of this creeping realisation? I think when we look back, when we first had kids, you look back to sort of our scenario then. I was 30. We'd just paid off our sort of student loans. We were sort of early on in our careers. We'd actually, we were living in a one bed flat in London and the actual sort of thought around actually how much are children really going to cost us over their lifetime? You know, we were only just sorting ourselves out if we're totally honest. So I think it did dawn on us quite quickly though. I vividly remember having a conversation with Dan's dad about him saying to me, you see, you're going to put them through private education because if you are, you really need to start sort of thinking about it now (laughs) because you need to plan that. So yeah, quite quickly, we did start thinking, okay, we do need to start planning and making some investments here so that we can actually do the things that we want to do. And I think that will happen at a very interesting time because that dawns on you at the moment where you have children. So, you know, Lucy said about student loans, clearing those, buying the house, living a little because we wanted to have some fun and travel a bit before we had children. But our eldest was born in 2009 and professional life was actually pretty uncertain back then. We were post great financial crisis. So they were tricky times. And we'd just sold our one bed flat and bought a four bed house out of Windsor. At the same time, the Lucy's well paid job went to statutory maternity pay. I took a significant pay cut at that time to change industries. 
We literally had no money. We even took in a lodger to help us pay the bills at that time. But this is the very moment that you realise that you need to start saving for your children and that parenting cost. So Dan, how comfortable were you investing at this stage? If I'm perfectly honest, beyond our pension contributions, we hadn't really thought about investing. Lucy had some ISAs which had been set up by her family, but we hadn't really done that much ourselves. But uh, Lucy got onto this. I know, Lucy, if you want to talk about what you set up at that point. Yeah, so when the children were born, at the time I was conscious that I should be doing something, as my parents did for me. So the only thing really available at the time was the child trust funds. But outside of that, we set that up. And then outside of that, we didn't really know what else was available to us then. That's right. So the Child Trust Fund was later, that was shelved, but it became the sort of junior ISA, didn't it, later on? Yeah. And, you know, Marcus, that was quite an interesting time because the options available on the Child Trust Fund, from my recollection, was pretty limited. Whereas it moving to a junior ISA gave us the full spectrum of investments. We could actually DIY invest. And that really came about at a time where we were much more comfortable investing. Uh, so it was good timing. And of course, today that you have £9,000, I think it is, per child with your junior ISA in terms of allowance. OK, Lisa, let's go to children's education. You sort of mentioned that briefly. Why did you decide that private education was so important for your children? I guess just touching a little bit on both Dan and my education. So Dan was privately educated. I had a mix of private and state education. So we had quite a rounded view of different education that's available. And there is some fantastic state education out there, but you don't know what your children are going to need and what type of children they're going to be, but you do want to make sure that you can give them the opportunities that are right for them. And as our children got older, we actually wanted to seek out an education that was broader than just the academic and would really allow them to thrive in the areas that they love. And the state schools in our area are great, but we wanted to look at the independent schools that could give a much broader education for them. And that's why it was important to us to move them across and to the private education. Did you feel it was going to be a stretch financially? Definitely. (laughs) Dan, I'll probably let you uh, talk more about that. (laughs) Yeah, it was daunting. I'm not going to lie about that. And, you know, it still stretched us. Does it worry me? Yes. And actually, quite frankly, it's hard to believe there are many people out there who are not finding it a massive stretch and having to make very big compromises in order to do it. And Lucy, did you feel like you together as a couple kind of you needed some financial advice or that you could go out and learn this stuff yourself? Yeah, well, I think Dan working in the industry that he does obviously gave us a lot of confidence. One aspect that we really did need some confidence on, though, was around our financial planning, because even though Dan and I both work and we both earn sort of well, Every month, we seem to be sort of living right up to our limits. So we needed to understand that actually, if we were going to make this commitment with private education, it wasn't going to push us too far beyond our means and it was sustainable for us. So we did take advice on our financial planning at that stage. It's quite often the case, isn't it? It's usually when you're starting out and you've got quite simple goals, it's easy to get going on your own. But when you start having much more complex financial matters, that's when it becomes really useful to seek financial advice. Okay, interesting. And then, Dan, what did you decide when, did they create sort of investment suggestions alongside the plan or did you want to do that yourself? How did that sort of roll out? So I wanted to do that myself, the investment piece. It was just that financial planning and the cash flow modeling that I wanted to get that expertise. And so we bought that advice from an IFA that we'd uh, worked with in the past. So confident that we could do this because you know, private education, one of those things that once you're on the train, you can't get off. So you need to have confidence that you can follow through. So confident now that we could do it, I set up the investment plan that we were going to use in order to do that. And whilst an element of the school fees is paid from you know, our annual income, the investment part plays a really important role. And I guess there are three aspects to that. There's the reserve element of you know, money in case something awful goes wrong. You've got the growth element, but also that income supplement. So I'm running three parts to the investment portfolio. 
Okay, interesting. Let's explore that in a little bit more detail. So what do you mean by each of those things? You you said the income element. Do you want to describe each element? Okay, so the reserve side is, you know, what if we had a dreadful year? What if there was an unforeseen incident in the family and uh, I needed to draw down on the rainy day fund to keep the kids in education. So that's an element of the investment portfolio that is relatively safe, relatively liquid assets. It's not growing particularly quickly, but I know that I can draw on that at pretty short notice. So you have that part to give you the buffer. The growth part is that we have a lot of years of school fees ahead of us. And so to be able to grow that investment is a really helpful way of making it more affordable with three kids and assuming you put, you know, you have 10 years worth of private education per child, that 30 child years worth of school fees. So it's a big number. So growing that investment is important. And the final part is the income supplement. You can't do this all from your annual income. And so having dividends coming through off the income part of the portfolio just really takes the sting out of the annual school fee bill. Interesting. So you've constructed a portfolio that has different levels of risk so that the money you use today is in much lower risk assets and the money that you're trying to grow much further into the future, you put into riskier assets so you can try and get a better capital return. And then you've got certain elements of it that will kick out a yield. So that then enables you to top up school fees, I guess, that you're paying. Yeah. And I think that the common theme that binds all those together is there's diversification in the portfolio. I simply can't afford to have one thing knock us off course here because it's too important. So you feel that investment trusts are particularly good for this kind of approach? Yes, I do. I think that if we were to take particularly the second two categories of the investment portfolio, the growth and the income, growth works incredibly well with an investment trust with that permanent capital The portfolio manager can take higher risk, higher conviction investment decisions because they know that they will not be facing redemptions. They can gear it up. So great for growth ideas. And then on the income side of the portfolio, being able to build dividend reserves means that there is continuity of income stream because the school fee bill is there every year. I can't afford to have a gap in that dividend just because BPs cut the dividend or Vodafone have or whatever. So that smoothing of the dividend when you're actually relying on this as an income stream is really important to me. Okay. And then Lucy, let's move on to you. There's obviously some other big goals that they have. Are you thinking about those as well? Are you investing for those? Yeah, so I guess one of the sort of next major things that we're thinking about is actually how we help the kids as they get older and actually how we set them up um, further on in their lives, whether that be helping them to get on the property ladder or something else that they might choose. But I guess for us, it's like getting onto the property ladder is one of those major hurdles and certainly something that if my family hadn't made investment for us, we would have really struggled with buying our first property. So we really valued that when we bought our first property. And so it's something that we would like to do for our children as well. Absolutely runaway sort of housing prices. And if you don't want them coming back and living with you until they're 40, I suppose, you kind of need to think about that. In market, it's quite interesting when you start doing the sums on it. And I, I was, you know, so last night when Lucy and I were having dinner, we were just sort of, knocking this around in terms of actually what does that look like if you assume a two-bed london flat's going to cost you half a million pounds you're looking at a two hundred thousand pound deposit so if the kids when they come out of education get their first job were to be able to put away 500 pounds a month which would be not bad off a graduate salary it would take them 33 years to save up a deposit so they would definitely be back with us if that happened. And that's not what we want at that stage in our lives. And we certainly can't afford to keep paying their food bill. <laughs> so are those the major ones? Is there anything else that you sort of thought about that sort of worried you about their financial future? I think those are the two biggies. I think it's then for us, it is about making sure that our children have the opportunities that we can give them to them so whether that be in sailing whether that be rugby whether that's about travel and we can help and support them with that as well but the two biggies are definitely great education and set them up sort of for the future okay finally i just wanted to ask what advice you would give our listeners with perhaps young families who are thinking about providing for and helping with their futures such as you have 
from me, I think it can be really daunting because, as we said right at the beginning, actually, we really didn't have very much money at all when we first had children. It was all being spent on our goings. But what we did start doing, so I started investing £25 a month and Dan would put in lump sums as and when he could. And doing those little bits at the start really helps later on because your salaries improve, etc. You can start adding more, but it's very hard to go back and retro invest, as it were. Mm, it's that sort of compounding effect as well. Time is very much your friend, so starting as early as possible is quite important. Dan, is there anything you would add to that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Lucy in terms of that. Do what you can early. You can never start early enough. But also, you know, one of the things that we found really effective is you know, getting the family to help with this. And you know, one thing that my parents do they have a budget per grandchild for Christmas and birthday presents. And if the present they buy is not up to that, they put the balance into the junior ISA. And so it all helps out. And it's amazing how that builds up. And I think also just being mindful of what the investment horizon is. Junior ISAs can't be touched until they're 18. And they may well keep it invested for longer than that. We hope so anyway. And so you need to make sure that you are taking enough risk for the investment horizon you've got there in order to get that return. Okay, well, I think that's probably given our listeners lots to think about when it comes to some of those financial challenges surrounding their children, with hopefully some ideas for solutions too. I'd like to thank Dan and Lucy Howe. It was great to speak to them today. And I think they've made clear that starting as early as possible is often a good idea and makes reaching those financial goals that little bit easier. In the next episode, we'll explore why it's so critical to plan for your own financial future, including the all-important retirement, despite juggling the many financial responsibilities you might have as a parent. In the meantime, you can find further information on planning for your family's financial future by searching Janice Henderson Biggest Investment or visiting janicehenderson.com forward slash biggest investment. Until then... Goodbye. Liquid, the ability to buy or sell a particular security or asset in the market. Assets that can be easily traded in the market without causing a major price move are referred to as liquid. Yield, the level of income on a security typically expressed as a percentage rate. For equities, a common measure is the dividend yield, which divides recent dividend payments for each share by the share price. For a bond, this is calculated as the coupon payment divided by the current bond price. Gearing. Gearing is the measure of a company's debt level. It is also the relationship between a company's leverage, showing how far its operations are funded by lenders versus shareholders. Within investment trusts, it refers to how much money the trust borrows for investment purposes. important information not for onward distribution before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved you may wish to consult a financial advisor this is a marketing communication please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and annual report of the AIF before making any final investment decisions past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend on an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for regulatory record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janice Henderson Investors. Janice Henderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services 
are provided by Janice Henderson Investors International Limited. Registration number 3594615. Janice Henderson Investors UK Limited. Registration number 906355. Janice Henderson Fund Management UK Limited. Registration number 268531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited. Registration number 2606646. Six, each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate, London EC2M. 3AE and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and Henderson Management S.A. Registration number B22848 at 2 Rue de Bitburg L-1273 Luxembourg and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance de Secteur Financier. Janice Henderson, Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janice Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright Janice Henderson Group PLC.